Welcome back to our series on Plato's Republic. In this episode, we will be discussing the famous allegory of the cave, which occurs at the very beginning of Book 7 of Plato's Republic. And this allegory is uh, widely known, uh, but I believe there's a depth to it that's often missed. And uh, I believe that it also serves a very uh, fruitful um, segue into an understanding of a uh, concept uh, that's deeply um, central to uh, spiritual theology, uh, which we'll talk about um, in, in passing towards, towards the end of this episode, uh, having to do with St. John of the Cross's Dark Night of the Soul. I believe there's something similar occurring in uh, Plato, uh, especially this this idea of the ascent out of the cave and the, the notion of blindness as a type of sight and uh, coming to know um, the sun, seeing the sun as a blinding light, which is a way of trying to describe seeing the good uh, fully is something which blinds. And so it... it, it um, almost appears as a, a type of um, darkness in a way, right? It's trying to see the sun um, blinds, it, it, it almost takes away your vision. Uh, a knowledge of the good as it is in, in itself uh, also uh, uh, analogically is blinding. So we'll, uh, we'll actually read some of, um, some of the stanzas from St. John's um, uh, poetry on the dark night of the soul. Um, and it'll uh, uh, hopefully come to light, no pun intended, in, in, um, with the background of uh, the Republic. So we will jump right into Book 7 and the, the cave allegory. Okay, so the, the first thing to note about this allegory is Plato is not timid in uh, articulating what this is supposed to be an allegory of. And part of Part of, uh, I think, what's what's going on is Plato is almost at a loss, and he even says this, he has Socrates say this, uh, at a loss of how do you describe this? How do you describe what he's trying to describe? It's almost an impossible thing. Uh, we've alluded to this last time with uh, what is it like to live a, a life of music, like a musical life? What is that type of... Um, experience of knowing how to play an instrument um, intuitively. Uh, it's very difficult to describe that to someone, just as it's difficult to describe um, what it is to ride a bicycle. Uh, those are you know, more mundane things, but it, the, the, the way you go about describing the knowledge of riding a bicycle is very um, difficult, right? How do you describe that, um, uh, the, that process or that, that task? Um, likewise, what Plato is doing here is he's trying to describe what education is. And as, as uh, we'll see, and as we've already seen, it's very difficult. And so he uses an allegory, not to try to make something simple uh, difficult, but rather the reverse. He's trying to take something which uh, is really difficult, and he's trying to place it within a, 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 a more... Um, you know, um, direct uh, experience that 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 we might have, or that we can at least conceive. So then we can begin to make this um, transition to the depth of what education really is and what it really amounts to. So the very first sentence of Book Five says, uh, or begins uh, uh, this way. Next, then compare the effect of education and that of the lack of it on our nature to an experience like this. So the whole allegory is supposed to give us some insight. Uh, and notice, once again, the, the, the language I'm using. I didn't do this on purpose. It's just deeply rooted in how we talk about understanding, explaining, knowledge. I talk about insight, a type of seeing into something, right? And this is going to be almost what Plato is trying to articulate, right? Um, there's some, there's some um, insight into what education and the lack of education uh, brings about in, in the human uh, life. Uh, and he's going to do this by talking about this um, situation where you have 
human beings living in an underground cave-like dwelling. Uh, it's sort of a far-fetched example, but once again, it's, it's just to make a point. So try to understand it in a literal sense and then try to un uh, like step back and think about it more like a, like a parable. Like what's the spiritual interpretation of this? And so if you just get hung up on the, 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 the literal details and you don't read it more like a parable, then you're going to just completely lost um, and like about what it really means. Okay, so these people stuck underground um, facing a wall. They're, they've been chained there their whole life. And behind them uh, is uh, a wall. And then slightly above the wall, you think of like a hill kind of going uh, up out of the cave behind them, but they're facing the opposite direction. They're, they're turned away from the exit, um, looking at the wall at the bottom of the cave. And behind them, there's this wall behind the wall. There's a little fire. And there's people walking back and forth um, behind this wall. Think of like a little like, it's almost like a puppet um, a puppet wall. So they're, they're standing behind the wall, holding up little uh, statues and things. The light is shining on the statues and it's projecting these shadows on the wall in front of these people, right? So you could think of it as just like a, you know, a ancient Greek puppet show. And um, the, uh, the, 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 the prisoners have been watching these shadows their whole life and they don't know any different, right? So the thing to realize about this situation is that the prisoners don't know that they're prisoners. The prisoners think they're perfectly free. They think they're looking at all there is to look at. They think they're fully um, fulfilled. They think they're living perfect um, lives. And part of the reason for this um, uh, um, this 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 duping that they're in, that they've been they've they've sort of been duped. They've been led astray. Um, and part of the reason for this, I, I take it, is that these prisoners, as um, uh, Socrates articulates at like 515a, he says, uh, they are like us. So here's the first thing to note, uh, or maybe not the first thing, but a very important thing to note, is that these prisoners are us. Right? It's not, oh, those stupid people down the road. These prisoners are um, uh you know, allegorical representatives of of you, of me, uh, of all of us. So don't think that these are the these are the ignorant people, and, and I'm a I'm a smart person, so I'm not in that situation. Um, that's that's not the not the case. So they're like us. I mean, in the first place, do you think these prisoners have ever seen anything of themselves and one another besides the shadows that the fire casts on the wall of the cave in front of them? So the, the prisoners are completely ignorant of their own uh, life, their own um, situation in, in the world. They don't know where they are, who they are. Um, there's a type of um, uh, ignorance of self that they possess, which then carries over to why they're ignorant of everything around them. Uh, okay, so the uh, um, at the heart of this allegory is ignorance, and specifically, it's not just ignorance of the stuff around you, but the 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 real um, the real problematic here is uh, an ignorance of of self, right? So that's um, that's going to be a very significant. Uh, thing that's going to reoccur. Uh, and it's this type of ignorance, which is what brings about this um, enslavement, right? So they're enslaved. What are they enslaved to? Uh, they're enslaved to the, the, the false, right? The, the, um, they're, they're enslaved to uh, what isn't real, what isn't true. Um, and that's because they can't properly see or they're not properly seeing and so the um the situation is one where they are uh at a loss of um how to live 
um, because they don't even understand uh, what it means to live, what it is to live, because they haven't even thought about their own life, which is the one uh, you know most direct example of life. It's the one that you have, right? So if you can't reflect on what it is for you to live, then uh, the question on what it is for my neighbor to live or the person uh, you know across the world to live, that's all just going to be as Plato seems to articulate in this allegory. That's just going to be shadows. It's just going to be words that don't have any real meaning. Okay. And so uh, the way that he, he carries this on is these people, these prisoners, have really sophisticated conversations with each other. But the stuff that they're talking about doesn't have any real weight. It doesn't have any real meaning. Um, it's just, as he, as he calls it, it's just about these shadows. And so they don't actually um, communicate or talk about anything of uh, real um, depth. Uh, the conversations are always at the at the surface level, even though they might be saying all the the the, the, the right things. Um, it just doesn't it doesn't really mean anything to these people. Um, and remember, these people are you and I. Um, okay, so. Uh, continuing on a little bit later, this is uh, I don't know, a couple lines down. Um, Socrates says, all in all, then, what the prisoners would take for true reality is nothing other than the shadows of these artifacts. These artifacts that, that these um, these people are that, beh- that are behind them are holding up above the wall, right? Like the puppet masters, if you will. Um, and uh, they think that that's reality. Uh, they can't really conceive of anything else. Uh, they, 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 are, they are so um, sort of single-minded or simple-minded that they can't even question whether or not um, what they are seeing is an image or a sign or it's representative of something more. Uh, and I think what... Uh, what, what Plato's trying to do with this passage is he's trying to use it to compare with our situation, which is we look around the world and we see trees and dogs and friends and spouses. Um, we, we, we listen to philosophy podcasts. We take college classes. We read books. Um, and oftentimes what people do is they just receive all that. They think about it. Um, and it's, it simply just means um, itself. It doesn't really um, incline us to anything other than this, um, if you want to call it this world or this way of um, conceiving or thinking. Uh, but there's a, a, a possibility, and this is where Plato is ultimately going to try to go with this cave allegory, there's a possibility that when you see something in the world, when you experience something in the world, it actually has the ability to redirect you to something beyond it. Um, that is, the world can take on the characteristic um, of, a, of, a, of a sacrament, of a sign, and that it can lead you beyond it. Um, and it's this, it's this type of seeing, this type of sacramental outlook, which is what the prisoners don't have. And so they're enslaved to the shadows uh, and they can't actually see the shadow and say, wait a second, maybe this is a shadow of something. And so maybe I shouldn't be looking at the shadow, but I should turn around and look at what this is a shadow of. That is, I should look at the reality itself rather than just the image. That would be like saying, maybe I should look at not just uh, my spouse, but what spousal love is an image of maybe it's an image of something um, more than than just itself. Even though it's a great good, it might actually be communicating something more. Uh, and so it's that type of seeing that the prisoners are incapable of. And and that's just the way. I guess that that's that's the way to think about how Plato's trying to describe education. Education is about learning to see in the sacramental way, which is a way of uh, 
leaving the cave, being able to leave the cave. And how that happens is um, difficult uh, uh, to, 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 to understand, but we'll, we'll give some examples to try to um, clarify this. Okay, so here's how it goes on. Uh, so consider then, this is the very next line from where I just read, consider then what being released from their bonds and cured of their foolishness would naturally be like. So if one of these prisoners was freed, uh, what would that be like? What would he experience once he was freed from his ignorance? The very first thing uh, that he would experience would be what? Uh, when one was freed and suddenly compelled to stand up, turn his neck around, walk, and look up toward the light, he would be pained by doing all these things and be unable to see the things whose shadows he had seen before. Because of the flashing lights. Okay, so the, the idea is the very first thing that he would experience if one of these prisoners had a, a slight glimpse of the fact that he was enslaved. That is, if he, if he were able to turn around and see the situation he was in, kind of take a third perspective situation on, on, on his life and realize, wait a second, maybe I'm not looking at reality as it really is. Um, in, instead, maybe I'm just looking at reality how I want it to be. Um, so there's a type of enslavement to my own desire on how I want reality to be. Um, the very first thing you would experience, Socrates says, um, would be this, this um, confusion, uh, right? It would seem like the world was literally turned upside down. And this is, I think, part of what he's toy or playing with it's a sort of a toy image of being underground and being above ground okay uh socrates goes on what do you think he would say if we told him that what he had seen before was silly nonsense but that now because he is a bit closer to what is and is turned towards things that are more he sees more correctly uh so he poses that a question poses it as a question and i think the the answer uh is that he would be um, incredibly puzzled uh, with these words, and he wouldn't initially believe it. He wouldn't want to believe it. It would it would require him to have to give up everything that he thought he knew. Uh, that is, everything that he had established as a way of control on how to manage the shadows, how to live in the world of the shadows. Um, he would have to r relinquish. He'd have to let that go. And he would have to be okay with turning around empty-handed saying, I'm leaving that, that world, that way of life. I'm leaving that, that type of um, uh, uh, control. And I, and I uh, don't know where this is leading me. And so I think the first step of education is, and this is why, the, the, as we described already, the, the philosophical character has to be one of humility, um, because it's the one who says, I, I begin education empty-handed. I don't turn to education so as to have my will be done, but I um, find that in education, um, it's, it's being, it's reality whose will is done. Uh, and, and what education is, is about me embracing that, um, turning to that. You could, and that's why it's regarded as seeing, because seeing is a type of... Um, embracing in a way. It's a type of taking in reality as it is. Um, and so the wider your eyes are, the more that you can um, embrace reality um, as it is rather than as you want it to be. And so I think uh, this is not something that would be the first reaction for someone who was enslaved. Um, and so it's a painful process. It's a long process. Uh, you can think about your own educational um development, um, things that you thought were the highest goods in the world, uh, Legos, uh, you know, all you wanted was the new Lego set. And then all of a sudden, uh, you come to get that and it's wonderful. You think this is heaven on earth. And then you're, uh, you find yourself left dissatisfied after a couple months. You don't, you don't like that 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 Lego set anymore. It becomes sort of um, valueless. It, you're looking for something else. 
Um, and then at a certain point, it might turn out that I'm looking at the world in the wrong way. Lego sets, that's just for like kids. Instead, what I, what I want now is, and maybe this is like when you turn, I don't know, uh, 11, 12 or whatever, you, you want a BB gun or something. And, and so that's going to be the, like the, the, the big carrot in the sky that you're, that you're seeking, that you're desiring. Um, uh, but this type of thing happens throughout our lives. It's different for different people. Uh, and it's, it's very common. Um, and, and in fact, I think it, it's almost just what it is to, to, to be a human uh, living in a physical world is that we, we see physical goods and because we're fallen, we take them to be um, the highest good and we are then left unsatisfied uh, once, we, once we attain that. Um, and so then we look for something else. And this type of recognition that what I thought was the point of my life isn't the point of my life anymore, there's something else, um, that's kind of um, you know unnerving or, or earth shattering because you're not exactly sure what to do anymore. Um, once you once you find yourself not really wanting what you used to want, um, life turns out to be a little um, confusing, and so you have all these different points in life where you get slightly confused because you're turning away from one way of seeing the world to a different way of seeing the world. And so you have to almost reorient yourself in, in, a, in a higher ordered way. Um, and that's a type of education, um, right? Education doesn't just mean reading books and taking classes. Uh, m more of what education uh, uh, is about is, is it's about uh, coming to see reality um, as it is and to be able to situate yourself in reality um, as, as it actually is. And this is a process that occurs and each time you take this next step, it's really um, perplexing and confusing. Um, another example that's probably familiar with, with some of you, maybe not all of you, but you, you know, you, you're thinking about the world and you're not sure why certain things happen and you come up with a you know, real simple story about why something falls to the ground and then you, you, you feel satisfied. And then all of a sudden um, you learn something in class that doesn't square with what you thought was true. And your initial reaction, and this is the case uh, pretty much across the board, your initial reaction is to be resistant of that because you think, no, this doesn't square with what I take to be true. And so you, you, you kind of want to keep it at bay because you want the truth. And the, 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 the situation is such that it is, you know, likely that many of us um, think that we know the truth when we don't really. And so when someone who's... Um, wiser than us, smarter than us, um, gives us a more accurate description of reality that, um, you know, might falsify our um, simpler understanding of, of reality. We're, we're resistant of that because it just doesn't seem to, to go with what we, quote, know to be true. And so we have to um, kind of wrestle with that and struggle with that and think through it. And we don't really know what to think anymore, and so sometimes this happens a lot of a lot of times in, in physics, uh, where we think we understand how something works. Some phenomena will come on the scene, and we'll we'll be very perplexed for you know several years trying to figure out how do we square this phenomenon with the the foregoing you know physical theory, and we're almost at a loss at how to do that. We don't know how to square these two things, and so we're almost like in the dark. Uh, you know, in regards to physics until some genius comes along is able to show the light um, that's shining in this darkness to make everything clear and you can understand, ah, oh, we were thinking about it the whole wrong way. We, we had all these presumptions that were actually the problem. We need to think of it in this different way. This happens with um, uh, the, the history of st astronomy, with um, geocentrism and the shift to... Um, uh, heliocentrism, uh, 
we were sort of thinking about um, things in the wrong way, uh, and, and it was it was difficult to conceive uh, of of certain possibilities because of certain presumptions that we were very um, disinclined to um, call into question. Um, but that's just what education um, is. It's about this willingness to pursue truth um, more than our opinions about um, truth. And so it's this willingness to um, be proven wrong. And so if you are not willing to be proven wrong um, about things um, that you could be wrong about, then uh, you've kind of proven yourself unable to be educated. Um, okay, and so that's, uh, that's a really important um, I don't know, reflection on, on education and how uh, it, 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 it requires this, this um, radical willingness to, uh, to progress towards the truth even when you know that you don't know what that is or where that's going to lead. Um, and this is, I think, at the heart of also why a lot of people, you know, convert um, almost when they've, they've said they never would. It's only when they have this, this philosophical educational spirit, which is to say, I'm going to follow truth uh, where it leads me. Um, and w- if you have that willingness, then you're open to being led um, to things that you never would have been. Uh, willing to admit at the at the start that you would you know end up with uh, okay so um, okay so th- returning to the cave allegory um, w- once freed uh, turn around it becomes confusing and you want to turn back to your old way of seeing because you think that makes more sense um, but that's just a, that's just once again a, a an inclination to self-deception because it's easier that way. It's, it's cognitively easier to hold on to the old way of thinking because now you don't have to um, continue to ask these questions that you don't know how to answer. Um, but if he were to be led, as he says, um, or not really led, uh, this is 516a, and if someone dragged him, so he's not being led, but he's being dragged. So education requires um uh, um, companionship. Someone else has to aid you in this. Um, very, very, uh, 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 very rarely will someone ever come to um, education on their own. It's something that that you um, receive from another. Just like a language, you, you don't. No one teaches themselves a language. At least their primary language. They always learn it from another. Language is a social phenomenon, right? It's a, it's a communal phenomenon. Uh, and I think education is a communal reality too. It, it's something that you, you, you um, participate in or you, you engage in with, with others. And that could be other humans or it could be um, a, a other in regards to just reality. That could be books or it could actually just be um, the, the, the physical world itself. Sometimes scientists um, think of experiments as a type of dialogue with reality. You, you do a test, it's almost like asking a question to reality, and you get the results um, from the test, and it's like an answer. And sometimes the answer isn't what you expected. And so you have to be willing to, to, to listen to nature and to say, maybe I'm not thinking about this the right way. Uh, the physical world has just communicated something to me that doesn't square with what I thought it was going to say. Uh, maybe the problem isn't with the physical world, but maybe the problem is with my preconceptions of it. And so maybe I need to change my theory or my way of conceiving of things. So even um, uh, uh, you could think of education as just a dialogue um, with another. And, it, and it's, um, it has to be a philosophical dialogue in the sense of an openness to, um, to, 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 to pursue the truth beyond your own... Um, desire for uh, control of, of reality. Okay, so, but once he's once he's dragged out of the cave, um, out into the sun, he, he it's, it's described as, uh, Socrates describes as, he's pained and angry at being treated that way. Uh, very rarely do people like to be proven false. 
Uh, people don't like to be proven wrong. Um, but the thing to realize about this is it's, it's good for you to be proven wrong. It's good for you to be proven false. Uh, just as it's good for you to receive medical treatment, even if it doesn't please you, um, you, you, you have to take some medicine that doesn't taste good. You have to fast for five days because of a medical procedure. It doesn't feel good to do that, but it's still good for you to do that. Um, likewise, it's good for you to be proven wrong. It's like a type of um, you know, psychological medical treatment, if you will, to be proven wrong. Uh, painful, sure, but still um, it's good. It, it, it makes you better. Um, and so, uh, once he's dragged out of the cave, uh, he, he's brought into the sun and it blinds him, right? So, um, it's disorienting. He's not sure where he is. He's not sure what to think. He's not sure what to look at. Um, he's not even sure, um, you might say, uh, if this is, if this is just a false view uh, and the real views back down in the cave, the real reality is back down in the cave. Um, but the longer that he spends time out of the cave, Socrates says, the more he comes to see, and the more he comes to see, the more he realizes that the life in the cave was really only um, a partial life. It was a life that was um, representative of this more complete uh, more uh, um, fulfilled life out of the cave. And and so that's why you get the idea of the shadow. This is really significant. The shadows, shadows aren't pure um, evil. Shadows aren't just pure ignorance or not, nothingness. The shadow, think about what a shadow is. A shadow is uh, an image, but it's an image that, 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 that that's... Um, it requires uh, or it necessitates uh, the presence of light, right? So you can't have a shadow unless there's some some form of light. Um, now, granted, the shadow is not the reality itself, but it's an image of the reality that comes through uh, the light. So I think the way to think of this is even false opinions. You, you believe something and it's false. That can even serve a role in your own educational development because it is uh, possible that by being shown that that is false, by being shown that that is just a shadow, uh, you are now capable of orienting yourself towards the real light, towards the real things. Um, so by being proven wrong or false, you're now better oriented towards the true. Um, now, if you have a, a, a large ego, if you're a prideful person, that won't be your, um, your response to being proven false. You'll just be really upset. Um, but a humble person, uh, once proven wrong, will come to realize that they're better for it, right? They're, they're, they've been made well. And so uh, at, at one point uh, in, in another dialogue, Socrates says, if you can prove me wrong, I'll I'll be all the more thankful for you um, uh, because you're the one that's going to have like dragged me out of the depths of hell and set me on the right road. And so my reaction to being proven uh, wrong or, or to being having my beliefs proven false should be gratitude. Um, and I think that's a that's a beautiful image that many of us um, have a difficult time actually putting into practice. Um, Okay, so so uh, once he is out of the cave, and he 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 is better acquainted, he comes to understand and see uh, things in a in a in a gradual way, and so he reflects that his vision gets better and better from moving from darker things to lighter things, right? So the shadows, and then he turns around and he sees the statues that the shadows were of. And then he slowly is led out of the cave towards brighter and brighter lights. You could think of like a moth in the cave being slowly led out towards brighter and brighter lights. Um, and, and so it's like a, it's a ladder. You could think of education 
as as a moving up of a ladder or an ascent uh, that 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 takes um, its its um, uh, action or it, it takes effect through this um, gradation of of brightness uh, and this is this is you know the, just just the allegorical image um, uh, and and eventually what happens is when he when he gets out of the cave he 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 looks at reflections of things in the on the ground and then in, in like the lake and then he slowly is able to look at like the trees and his eyes start to adjust and then he can like look up at the at the sky and look, see the moon and, and things and then eventually he'll come to see the sun uh, and the sun will have this. Uh, effect on him which will blind him so eventually when he reaches the, the the source of sight the source of seeing that which this whole journey was aimed uh, at uh, he comes to be blinded by it because it's so bright it's so um, full of what gives um, sight uh, that that it like overwhelms his his eyes and so he can't look at it directly um, Okay, it's sort of a mystical uh, image, uh, but a very, uh, I think, powerful one. Um, okay, man is not um, strong enough to um, look directly at the sun. It's just not in our our nature to be able to look at the sun. It'll blind us. And likewise, I think the way this goes. Uh, allegorically is man cannot know the good because remember the sun is the image of the good man cannot know the good in in and of itself directly it's too it's too um it's too much for man's intellect it's too much for man's uh um uh knowledge to 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 know the good um as it is and rather uh what it what it does is it is it blinds us it's seen as a type of darkness and so this is how this is how um, Socrates describes this uh, on 518a on the contrary anyone with any sense at any rate would remember that eyes may be confused in two ways from two causes when they change from the light into the darkness or from the darkness into the light if he kept in mind that the same applies to the soul then when he saw a soul disturbed and unable to see something, he would not laugh absurdly. Instead, he would see whether it had come from a brighter life and was dimmed, th uh, dimmed through not having yet become accustomed to the dark or from greater ignorance into greater light and has dazzled and, and was dazzled by the increased brilliance. Okay, so the idea is, you can be blind for two, two, two different causes. Two different things can can blind you. Um, you could you could be in the dark, and you go into uh, the, the 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 light. Uh, you're sleeping at night, and your parents turn on the light, and you are overwhelmed by the light, and you can't see. You can't really open your eyes because it's too bright. That's a type of blindness. Uh, the other type of blindness is you're you're you know you're in a room. And all of a sudden, the lights go out, and then you can't see. Um, both are ways of losing sight, uh, but the one is the result of having too much light. The other is the result of having too little light. And so just because someone is blinded or someone is unable to articulate or able to describe uh, something... It's either going to be because they just don't see it clear enough because they're um, uh, ignorant in regards to um, experience of it, or they can't describe it clear enough because they're like too close to it. It's just too intimate to them. It's too, um, it's too much to put into like simple words. Uh, and so this is, um, I think, something which, uh, a good example of this, the best example of this I can think of is 
uh, when I was engaged, someone once asked me, um, so what do you, what do you love about your, uh, fiance? Um, and, and I, and I was thinking, okay, what do I say? What's like the, 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 the one characteristic. And I couldn't like really figure out like one thing to say, because anything that I came to, it seemed like it was a real, um, just sort of simple minded articulation, uh, of why I, I loved my my um, now wife, but it 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 seemed so incomplete that I didn't want to say it because it was just it, it completely like missed the, the the point. I wanted to describe the whole, um, but all I could say was something about the the, the, the part. All right, going back to the beginning of the Republic, and so um, the the um, the person who who has these types of experiences realizes that it's difficult. To um, to articulate um, something that you know so well, because it's just so full, it's just so 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 complete that you can't really um, package it up neatly and nicely uh, into like a single bite-sized soundbite. Uh, and, and I think this is what ultimately the good is. The good is so over uh, overwhelming, so so vast. Um, that no, no single thing will compare to it. And once again, I think you could describe the good to um, to God. And in fact, this is where uh, neo Neoplatonists have, have taken this um, to describe God as the good. Um, especially Pseudo Dionysius and uh, Gregory of Nyssa go, you know, in great detail about um, this this aspect of um, knowledge of God um, exceeding our um, concepts, our cognitions. And so the only way we know God is through the fact that we have an ignorance of him. So the more that we know that we can't comprehend God, the m- more intimate we are with him as as a, a vast mystery. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful image, um, right? Uh, it's to say that we don't want to worship uh, an, an idol. We don't want to think of God as this, this, um, limited, you know, thing that fits this concept in, in my mind. Um, and so the more that I can understand that God exceeds, uh, my concepts, the, the, the more that my inability becomes representative of my paradoxically, um, knowledge of him, but it's not a conceptual knowledge. And I think that's what Plato is trying to articulate with this blindness as a type of knowing uh, or blindness as a type of seeing. Um, you see the sun, but that blinds you. You know God, but it far exceeds your, your grasp. And this is where um, ultimately um, I, I want to start to uh, wrap this up by transitioning to um, uh, St. John of the Cross and look at a little bit of what he says about the dark night of the soul. Um but I, I want to read one more uh, passage from uh, Book Seven before before we move there, because I think it'll be fruitful um, uh, when we turn to um, uh, John of the Cross. Okay, so this <clears throat> passage is five eighteen C. Okay, so here here's what here's here's how this goes. Socrates says, "Then here is how we must think about these matters, if that is true." Education is not what some people boastfully profess it to be. They say that they can pretty much put knowledge into souls that lack it, like putting sight into blind eyes. So some people think education is like, you just got to upload information into the empty mind. Um, Maybe that's what you think education is. Uh, You take these classes, and what these classes are is they're just like information dumps okay, fill me with a bunch of information. Um, if that's all education was, then being able to pass a multiple choice test would mean that you're an educated person. You've got all this, all these facts. You, you can say all the right things. Um, but that is very um, a very incomplete understanding of education. right? If that was all education amounted to, um, then you know, MacBook Pros would be far more 
uh, educated than than you, uh, because a MacBook Pro has a much uh, a much broader um, uh, you know hard drive for for an information dump to be um, uh, to be made. It can you know. Uh, retrieve that information far far faster it can retain that information far longer um, with more precision so if education was just about receiving data about receiving um, truth nuggets um, then uh, you know as as a as a rational being uh, we would be you know very inferior uh, and computers would be far superior uh, in regards to um, education. But that is not what education is, according to um, Socrates, right? So if that's what you thought education was, was just about receiving information, compiling information, collecting information about stuff that you don't know, um, this, this part of the Republic is for you. It's a, it has significant philosophical, uh, but also theological um, import. Okay, so he says, some people think that that's what it is, putting sight into blind eyes. But he says, but that's not the case for, for, for his account. Socrates goes on. But here is what our present account shows about this power to learn that is present in everyone's soul. And the instrument with which each of us learns, <clears throat> just as an eye cannot be turned around from darkness to light, except by turning the whole body, so this instrument must be turned around from what comes to be together with the whole soul until it is able to bear to look at what is and at the brightest thing that is. The one we call the good. Isn't that right? Gokhan says, yes. Of this then, of this very turning around, right? So, so the idea of turning around is going to be... Um, central it's gonna be integral to understanding education for plato and remember this is how the prisoner gets freed they turn around from the shadows to the light <clears throat> so this turning around there would be a craft concerned with how this instrument can be most easily and effectively turned around not of putting sight into it so it's not a matter of trying to put stuff into the eyes the problem is in the direction of the eyes where are the eyes aimed where are the eyes turned uh uh right that's the um that's the issue um right uh on the contrary it takes for granted that sight is there though not turned in the right way or looking where it should look and contrives to redirect it appropriately okay um if you've ever read saint augustine's confessions uh he he goes to great lengths to describe that he was turned towards lower things and he had to be educated to, to, to turn away from lower things to higher things. Um, that doesn't mean hating the world. Some people think, oh, to, to be turned towards God instead of this world, I have to like hate this world. But, but that's not what it means at all. It, it's, it's rather to be turned... Um, towards higher things or to be turned from ignorance to truth uh, or the darkness to the light, it's more like being turned from seeing parts to seeing a whole. So think about all these letters on the page of your book. Right, there's a bunch of letters on the page in the book. If your soul or your eyes was only turned or attuned to the letters, um, you wouldn't see uh, the Republic. You couldn't read the Republic if all that you were attuned to were letters, right? If, if, if that were the case, you would just read a book by just reading out letters, B-U-T-H-E-R-E-I-S. And that's not reading the Republic. Um, in order to read the Republic, you have to see the letters in a higher way you have to you have to turn to something more than letters um something higher than letters more holistic than letters um and you have to see the word you have to see the the parts as ordered to or communicating something higher 
And, and so there's an education that occurs when you learn to read because you've turned from seeing a bunch of ink to seeing letters, and then you've moved from seeing letters to seeing a word. Um, and, and this is, this is a, a, a process of education, right? And then once you understand the word, you can now string words together and understand propositions and sentences, and then you can understand um, ideas and concepts, and then this is slowly pushing you um, to understand uh, truth. And likewise, the same thing happens uh, you know, in a more incarnate form uh, in reality with I see colors, but colors are, are communicating something more than colors. Right, the color green is communicating, or it's it it means something more than just green. It's it's the green of a leaf. It's it's a way of the tree um, existing. It's a way of the the tree uh, being a tree. And and so then once you come to see, rather than just a, a blotches of color, you come to see these are actually colors of a tree this is probably all over child psychology you now have this higher concept the concept of a tree which incorporates colors um, but it's more than colors right and and then once you understand the concept of a tree um, you can then start to understand higher concepts like the concept of an ecosystem or something um, trees aren't just isolated things they interact with their environment in a, in a really complex way um, trees wouldn't be trees without the sun. Trees wouldn't be trees um, without oxygen. And so to understand the tree, it kind of leads you to something higher. It points you to something higher. And to be educated is to be able to turn from just seeing, you know, oh, here's a tree, here's a book, here's a human, and seeing it all interrelated in a way. And what this, um, what this is, it's a type of... Uh, education because you're able to turn from the part to the whole and uh, it's there all along this is the thing that that, that Socrates I think is trying to uh, emphasize the uh, just as the letters are on the page uh, and the words are on the page because the letters are you still might be blind to the words you don't see the words you're blind to the words and one of the reasons for that is because you might be so um, enamored with the pleasures of the font, right? So if there's probably no one like this, but if you're just so attached to the font type and all you can think about is the shape of the letters and the, you know, how, what color they are and what have you, um, you're not going to be concerned about that, that bigger, broader meaning known as the word. Rather, you're just going to be attached to this lower thing, the letter. Uh, analogously, that I think is occurring with if you're just attached to the pleasures of the physical world, you don't really understand what these pleasures are um, signs of. What the pleasures are a sign of, of the good, right? Pleasures are good. Pleasures are a sign of the good. But if you're just so attached to the pleasure as such, um, you become blind to the good. And so you don't really even understand the point of a pleasure. Likewise, going back to the analogy of the letter, if you're so attached to the font of a letter um, so that you can't see the word, uh, you don't really understand what letters are in the first place because letters, like the letter A, the letter B, they all, all those letters have a significance only in um, sort of conveying words. They, they, the, the point of a letter is to communicate or write words. And so if you don't understand a word, then you don't really even understand the letters, right? And so the, the, the thing that Socrates is trying to point out is um, something weds us to the lower things. And often it's, it's a distraction uh, thinking that the lower things are the fullness. And that can be thinking pleasure is the fullness, uh, Right, uh, that's the main the main thing that he has in mind. Uh, he he calls them the passions. Right, that's the fullness of of existence, the fullness of reality. That's what we live for. And if that's the case, then we don't really even understand the point of the pleasure. 
go back to the allegory of the cave. If you look at the shadows and you think that's all reality is, you don't really understand what a shadow's nature is. Because what a shadow is in its very nature is it's an image of something. It's a sign of something, which means to understand a shadow would be like understanding something which is screaming out, don't look at me, look at the stuff that's making me. Look at the stuff that is um, communicating me. Okay, and so we have to kind of quiet those passions if we're going to be able to listen to uh, the, um, the, 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 the higher things that are being communicated or spoken through the lower things. Um, and this is what the dark night is. It's a type of pain. Remember we talked about education as a pain. It's a type of blinding, um, a darkness. It's a night, a lack of vision. But this lack of vision is um, only a lack of vision in one sense. In another sense, it's it's a it's a the first stage of a of a of a more true, complete vision. So so I'm just going to read a bunch of these stanzas. Uh, just reflect on this in light of what we've described in Plato's Republic. So I think you should be able to make this comparison. Okay, so just just listen to um, this. This is from the uh, the ascent of Mount Carmel of Saint John of the Cross. One dark night. Fired with love's urgent longings, ah, the sheer grace, I went out unseen, my house being now all stilled, in darkness and secure, by the secret ladder, disguised, ah, the sheer grace, in darkness and concealment, my house being now all stilled, on that glad night, in secret, for no one saw me, nor did I look at anything, with no other light or guide. This guided me, more surely than the light of noon, to where he waited for me, him I knew so well, in a place where no one appeared. O guiding night, O night more lovely than the dawn, O night that has united the lover with his beloved, transforming the beloved in her lover. Upon my flowering breast, which I kept holy for him alone, there he lay sleeping, and I caressing him, there in a breeze from the fanning cedars. When the breeze blew from the turret, parting his hair, he wounded my neck with his gentle hand, suspending all my senses. I abandoned and forgot myself, laying my face on my beloved. All things ceased. I went out of I went out from myself, leaving my cares forgotten among the lilies. Uh, I think the the um, I don't want to comment too much on this, uh, but the, the notion of this night guiding, uh, is is profound, and the reason it guides is because it's unsettling. It's it's there's an unfulfillment. You feel unsettled, unfulfilled. This is not a resting place. There is no rest. Um, and once you come to that recognition, not out of hatred. It's not that I hate this stuff, um, but you but you realize um, its real meaning is to tell you. Don't rest with me. Keep keep moving. Keep keep moving on. Um, that is that is the um, the the, uh, the the sense in which the darkness is a light. The the darkness is a guide, right? Uh, and I and I I mean, there's a lot more that can be said about this, um, but hopefully you can see that this notion of education in Plato plays a very uh, intimate. Uh, significant role in uh, the, 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 the mystical theological tradition of uh, the church.